welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Winter. Annie's already got me laughing. A uh, discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I am Jay Warmke. And I am Annie Warmke. Laughing Annie. And yes. today we're going to talk about reclaiming building materials or um, salvaging our future. All right. One of the things that we've talked about and we talk about a lot with the reclaiming of materials is really that secondary title, salvaging our future. When we throw things away, we throw away our past. And obviously, once it's gone, it's gone. So so our future is destroyed as well. I'm trying to make that connection to the future. So anyway, Annie, Annie, why? Why is this important? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You started me out laughing with your with your voices. Um, I think I think we want to consider the word deconstruct. Mm -hmm. So it's not about salvage anymore because that makes it sound like it's something you've taken out of the ocean from a shipwreck. But this is saying to have quality materials that can be reused over and over and over again, and that's really what we're talking about. So in this day and age, a lot of that is really old materials because they were over-engineered, because they didn't have the right tools, or because they were made super well. Um, and and this isn't, we're not just talking about wealthy homes or wealthy or expensive buildings. We're talking about many things that were constructed. Right, just plain old barns. You know, yes. It's amazing the kind of materials that went into those. That's right. But the challenge we have today is the materials are cheap and they're petroleum-based a lot of times. I mean, all the stuff they're putting on the sides of buildings now are basically plastic of some sort. Mm -hmm. And so th these materials are not really salvageable. So what we want to talk about today is why this is important and um, and how this would work if you wanted to salvage something or uh, uh, use materials that have been used for something else. I think what we're we're finding or what we're trying to allude to here is that in in decades centuries past, you know, people over engineered um, their buildings. They used the materials that were on hand. They used quality materials. It was usually handcrafted. And in the post World War II um, society that that we've grown up in, it's become how do you minimize labor? How do you minimize costs? Uh, so it's just kind of get it up, get out of there, with no real thought. Not only to craftsmanship, I don't want to say that because a lot of these people consider themselves craftsmen, and some some of them are. Well, they're but, working with cheap material and they're making it look good, so they are right. You start to see you see aluminum siding instead of cedar siding, or then you know aluminum. vinyl. No, it's plastic. I know, but it was aluminum first. Oh, okay. Then it became vinyl. Now you see OSB, you know, oriented strand board instead of uh, um, you know plywood or even planking. As as was the case in in centuries past. Well, one of the one of the issues really is that always we have reused materials. So uh, having taken apart nine barns, are you talking about we meaning you and as I a culture, or we as a as society? As a culture, so over time, uh, one of the things one of the first things I learned when I was starting to take barns apart is that there were reused pieces in the barn, and it was fun to kind of try to guess. What kind of building did that come out of? Because you can tell sometimes by the way the wood was processed and what kind of wood or what type of wood, uh, what that really, uh, where that really came from. So they used what they had, which is the first use in sustainability. The first rule of sustainability is use what we have, just like nature does. And that's what they call biomimicry. And be frugal. Well, but that's nature. Yeah. And so we're reusing what already exists, and that's what we're really coming to. So... We can begin to do this now in a more concerted, honest way, or we can be forced to do it. It reminds me of a story I heard one time. I think it was a church, and they were talking about how over the decades and century, the front step, which was a stone step, had been worn down in the middle as people walked in. So there was a little dip in this step, and they found that to replace this piece of granite or whatever was going to cost many, many thousands of dollars. So then they decided, okay, well, what we can do is we can take this thing out, we can turn it over, and we can use the other side and face the dipped side to the ground. And when they did that, they found that like a century before it had been turned over and there already. was a dipped side already facing the ground, you know, so, so good ideas come back yeah. around. So what you're saying, though, here um, is – 
is, okay, we need – we know people have done this in the past and we know we've slipped away from it as a culture. So now how do we more systematically look at our buildings as sources to mine materials from? Yeah as they're no longer useful. Well, one of the challenges we have today is that we're being told what to use. So people are going, or even contractors, going to places like Lowe's and Home Depot, and they only have a certain number or certain selection of things. I was shocked a a number of years ago when I was working on the house, and and I happened to obtain an uh, uh, architect and contractor a book of materials, and it was, I, I think it was about eight inches thick, and it was full of thousands and thousands and thousands of items, and almost none of the, uh, those are you ever going to see in a store like uh, one of the box stores. So what we have to do is to say, look, all, the, all these materials are out there, and we need to figure out in our planning process how to avoid the likes of Lowe's and Home Depot and shop more locally at maybe lumber yards and places like that. But we want to reuse and repurpose and repair items that are going to go into whether we're remodeling or building something new. Um, we, we really, really want to come from that perspective in the planning. So, And we also want to construct in a way that we can deconstruct. Right. I was going to jump in and, and say that because, again, I was not a builder when we started at Blue Rock Station. And I would hesitate to call myself a builder today, even though I built a lot of stuff. But mostly— not stuff. You've built more than 16 buildings okay. on our land alone. Right. But, but because I mess up so much— I've learned to try and deal with constructing to deconstruct because I know I'm going to have to take it apart in the future to <laughs> fix it. This is and not the rule I'm talking <laughs> about, know, Jay. but this is the it's reality. absolutely not the rule. So it's certain things like <laughs> instead of using um, – because we're getting ready to build another building, and I'm thinking, okay, I want to use two-inch screws on this thing, not nails, because if I ever have to take this thing apart, it's a heck of a lot easier to just unscrew it than to try and smash it with this a hammer. This is so great because I remember putting tin on the top of one of the buildings and saying, why are we nailing this? We'll never get it back up. And you're like, go on. Yeah, move along. Just move along. Going. Nothing to see here. Yeah. Right. So, mm-hmm. okay, anyway, so, that's, so we wanna, but that should be part of every construction Well, process. it should be, and it is where we're going. So instead, what we do is smash everything up and take it out, and we put it in the dump. And everybody isn't doing that. Some cities have ordinances now where things have to be reused. But the amount of reclamation that's available for purchase for buildings um, is, I think, minuscule compared to what's out there. So one of the problems in um, putting together things and then being able to deconstruct them is it does take time. It takes planning. And, of course, you've got to clean the material or whatever. But if we're thinking about it in a way that says at some point this building may need to come down and we put it together with that in mind, what we're really doing is building for the future. Sure. But there should be no illusion that reusing older materials does take time. It, it takes time. There's a lot of work. It it's takes like a twice lot of, as much work. Absolutely. Or maybe three times because you're, mm-hmm. you've are you got to take it apart. You've got to store it somehow. You and You've got to clean it. You, you have gotta, to clean it and preserve it. And it's not all uniform in size. And no. the edges aren't always straight. And, yeah, it's a, it's a pain. But It sounds like when you're building. Well, that's after I build it. The edges aren't straight. you got to clean it. That's you know? right. Darn it anyhow. Pull but, nails. But what yeah. we are seeing here is is for a long period of time, for decades after World War II, materials were cheap and labor became more and more expensive. So minimize labor. Who cares about the materials? I think we're beginning to see a transition to where materials are no longer inexpensive. If you go down and even buy two-by-fours, uh, metal, anything. I was looking at a box of screws. It was $16 or so. Well, you know, we have all small... kinds of crazy stuff going on with... Yeah, yeah. With... So now you're saying, okay, I can now begin to substitute time. Once again, putting labor into the equation to a greater extent and minimize materials, you know, minimize the cost of materials. So, so it's kind of the pendulum swinging back a little bit. Well, also, the kinds of materials that we have access to are going to determine how we're going to alter the design of what we're trying to build. And that takes a certain skill set. And unfortunately, lots of people are not learning these skill sets 
today in school. So there's a big learning curve. There's a learning curve in how to deconstruct things, especially if they're put together poorly. And then there's the learning curve of, of how to actually make them fit into the project. But I have to say that from the very beginning um, of my deconstructing and constructing career, I'll say that very loosely, <laughs> Um, it was fun. It was exciting. And I love barns. I never met a barn I didn't like. I don't even care what the condition is because it's got a story and it tells the story and how it's constructed. But some of the materials you find in there are just amazing. I mean, they we are. found some planks of cherry, planks of walnut, just as, you know, floorboards in a hayloft or whatever. Yeah. And then you get those great huge blocks of sandstone and, and those things mm -hmm. are cool. And occasionally you'll find a an old uh, iron hay oh, hook well, or uh, something like that. Lots of things, so lots of beautiful things, grist stones, and uh, you know, working in dairy barn, there was a lot of cool artifacts. But but the reality is, these things are out there every day. And so I'm just talking about barns. But when you think about houses or uh, other uh, important buildings that are deconstructed or, or m knocked down in a lot of cases. They're full of these stories and they're full of the beauty of that architecture. Um, and But we're just not seeing that much of it and certainly not in our region. And it's it's vital that we begin to think differently about those materials because we can't make them anymore. Right. And, and I think when you mention stories, if you're out there in an entrepreneurial way, um, the story has value as well. It's like with antiques, the provenance. I know when you were deconstructing barns, um, you tried to learn as much about those barns as possible. And then the products that were made from that barn, you then included the story of the barn. Like yeah, this. well, we got more money for it. We actually sold out. We, we took the ends of the boards that we chopped off because they weren't really any good for anything. They had been on the ground or whatever. And we made um, birdhouses with um, this beautiful wood that would have just been burned up. And we put the story with it in a little tag and talked about how you could work with your children and tell the story of the slaves that had, you know, hidden in this building and things like that. And people love that. People want the story, and they will pay more for it, for sure. Mm -hmm. One of the other issues when you're dealing with deconstruction, because you can become a junk man pretty quick. A if hoarder. You're starting, more yeah, like a hoarder. hoarder. We're not you're, talking about hoarding. We're talking about actually reuse and re Right. So you begin to look at, okay, how can I salvage this beautiful wood? But then storage issues become a problem. How do you store this without getting it subject to termites, without water damage, without well, things like well, that? Well, it's even more than that because those are issues. But also to know what to take versus what not to take. So you're mm -hmm. looking for quality. And many things are very high quality, even though they might have eight layers of paint or dings or whatever. It, it, you just really have to understand what per, what's quantity versus quality. And some a lot of the imperfections are the beauty of it. Absolutely. Or the pa fact that it was hand-hewn instead of cut with a saw, or how the holes were drilled for the pins in the barn. But many, many beautiful places that have all these kinds of things going, and they're just going to the dump or being burned. Mm -hmm. Well, I always say that the the fact that my walls are never straight or vertical and that the things never line up, that's part of the beauty. You know, the it's like ambiance. instant patina. The you know, warm key ambiance. In the structure. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> All right. Well, you are listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, reminding you once again it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. Thank God. And and uh, at the end of the world, hopefully we'll still have old barns to deconstruct, old homes yeah, to deconstruct. I'll be too old to care. Yeah. All right. Well, then it'll be the next person's turn All right. to care. Well, I, I want to tell the story. One of my favorite places I ever visited in this world was a British uh, British salvage warehouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could have stayed there for weeks and slept there and everything. And so it they was— They probably would have kicked you out eventually. Yeah. Well, it was so amazing. All these incredible staircases and— all the things that were outside that you could just look through repeatedly. Well, when you say staircase, I remember, you know, <laughs> there was one that was like 20 feet wide and yeah. three stories high yeah. and circular. And you're like, wow. Oh, my god! How'd they even get it in there? Yeah. But the reality is that it, that those kinds of artifacts are treated differently by different countries. And in this country, they probably would have burned the, the building down. But uh, – 
you know, that's the thing of it. It's this art, the value placed on art, the value placed on workmanship and quality. And um, I don't think we can say enough about that. Well, but one thing, and and I I, I guess to be fair to the good old U.S. of A., um, you know, in England, their their history reaches back a wee bit further than ours does. <laughs> Slightly, yes. Yeah, like the house we lived in was <laughs> built in 1600, you know, when when America was just a glint in somebody's eye. And uh, but but if you're going to salvage something and it's 300 years old, I think most people will say yes, yes, that's something that needs to be protected. But you got to protect the 50 year old thing before it can get to 300 years. Yeah, well, 50 years, it's still made better than anything they're sure, producing today. Sure. But we have to we have to begin today protecting those things that are made today in order that 300 years from now there will be this history for people to look back at the 2019 and say those were the days things were really built well you know? well we we'll better have to, we're going to have to go on a search for that because i can't really name anything at the moment but yeah. it's all plastic and petroleum oh, based oh those good old days of plastic i'm not sure there's a straight tube before to be had unless you go directly to the lumber yard mm-hmm. anyway let's talk about storage uses uh, issues because Um, people think a lot of times you can just go out and rip things apart and then just bring it back and okay. But in the instance of like barn wood, depending on what the wood is, whether it's siding or beams or uh, trusses or whatever, um, there's got to be a a place to store them and they've got to be up off the ground and they have to have spacers in between each board so that air can pass through. And that discourages bug activity, which you're probably going to have some problem with. And if the building has started to um, to fall down or has uh, some water rot or some bug damage, you're more than likely going to see a lot of um, deterioration in the wood. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try to use it. But just to be mindful that those things are uh, symptoms of many problems that buildings can have uh, when they're not being treated properly or the roof isn't working properly or the water drainage isn't working properly. Well, and you have to worry, too. Some of those times that you salvage a beautiful beam or something, you may be hauling the problem with you. That thing may be infested Absolutely. with bugs. Absolutely. Especially termites. So that's an issue. And then also, if you're de- deconstructing things out of a kitchen uh, or other wooden items, like you mentioned, that incredible stairway. You know, there's got to be a way to protect it until you're going to use it. Because most of the time, at least in our case, we weren't taking those things right away and using them. We needed to get to that point in the construction. So I know um, one time we um, we were well. We have a, a a plan. So we've got this plan about each year we're going to do this certain amount of construction. And so we and had, we usually accomplish about half of that, right? But we still have the plan. That's what's important, <laughs> and how we get there. That's important. And so in the beginning, we needed bricks. And I can remember m- more than one occasion I would come on the airplane to Columbus, and then I would get a rental car, and I'd be driving through the town. That's right before we get to our farm, and they would have knocked down a building, like an amazing, beautiful little cottage that was built in 1802 or something. And there would be bricks. And I would get out of the car. I was still in my suit. It didn't matter what time of year it was. And I would load the trunk of the car with as many bricks as I thought the poor car could handle and haul them. And we have that's how we've hauled lots of things. Uh, we've hauled sandstone windowsills out of uh, Victorian buildings that were smashed. Um, I'm sure I got a hernia after that. And uh, the idea, though, was we had a plan. Um, another time we were in... The plan was to rip off, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the night, find a construction site. And... No, it was never to steal anything. These things were being put in the dump, yeah. and they were just waiting well, for the equipment. Been, that's been one of the frustrations, because if you do end up finding the the person or the company that is tearing this thing down, it's almost impossible to get permission to actually salvage the material. They're real happy to load it up with a front end loader, dump it in a dump truck and go dump it in a, in a, in a landfill somewhere. But if you say, Hey, I'd love to come in and salvage as many of those bricks or as many of those blocks or whatever, then you just get met with hostility or indifference. Yeah, well, there's a lot of arguments against it. I've even offered to bribe or 
pay or whatever, and most of the time, or even network with people, and most of the time it didn't work. But sometimes it does. So one time we were driving in Wisconsin. We'd been speaking at a conference, and we're going to stay at this uh, um, bed and breakfast out in the countryside. And as we approached the building where the place was we were going to stay, on the left-hand side of the road, there was a big sign that said free, and it was the entire top of a uh, for a uh, flue for the roof that had even the wind cap on it and everything and the flashing and in a heartbeat it looked yeah it was like a six foot long chimney assembly yeah, yeah for the top of the roof mm-hmm. so I yelled stop the car and and I we need that and you said what are we doing with that and I said next year we're building a a rocket stove and you said Annie it won't fit in the back seat of the car and I said stop the car anyway so I got out and I said it's totally it's totally clean it's never been used it will fit we got it in the back seat of the car and I said you're going to love me cuz I'm going to show you how much that cost cuz you're always thinking in money I'm thinking in reuse and um and it was a $600 item yes uh, I, and I was fine with that cuz it was a rental car so I didn't have to clean it up <laughs> As well, it wasn't dirty, and but then the <laughs> next year we built the rocket stove. But also by letting people know, and in this day and age with things like Craigslist and Facebook and all kinds of social media, you can put it out there that you need things. So, mm-hmm. for example, we didn't we didn't ask for this, but um, some people called one day that had been to visit on tour at Blue Rock Station, and they said, "Well, we're taking all of the cedar siding off of our house, and the windows are coming out because we're going to put everything new. Would you like to have it?" Well, we're like, "Yeah," and they even said, "We'll bring it to you." And so that's been a wonderful um, addition. We've used it in a variety of ways and created beautiful settings with the big windows and the cedar siding. So again, letting people know and saying, "Look, we we want to reuse these things. We've gotten fixtures that way." Uh, for sinks and um, and at the at the reuse or the restores, um, I've gotten amazing doors that were somebody's art project for a very inexpensive amount of money. And, and that that butterfly sink is one that you're always proud of. of yes, I had I carried that in my the dimensions for nine years in my purse because I wanted to have a uh, two bay sink, but I wanted it to be on the corner. And everybody remarks about how great that sink is, but I I was patient. I know. You paid, what, like 15 bucks at a reuse store? It was store? brand new, and I was ready to give up. I had bought two um, stainless steel sinks, and we were going to try to figure out how to configure it together. And there it was laying there smiling up at me. Well, using that as an example, our almost our entire kitchen is reused from the old high school, um, the old Philo High School, when they— dramatically tore that place down. And uh, because we knew what we were looking for, we were able to get some beautiful um, stainless steel counters. Commercial. And mm-hmm. Commercial grade, yeah. They still but that's the same list that I carried in my purse for nine years. So so sometimes it takes patience, but if you have planning and you know um, what to look for. But also there are a lot of high-quality items out there in stores like the Habitat stores they call Restore there are lots of junk stores around that have a lot of really cool things. And sometimes things just lay acro- along the road. We have an adorable door and um, little panels, glass panels on either side. It's a very small door that we have included in one of our little Hobbit House uh, straw bale buildings. And it wouldn't be the same building if it didn't have that. But that door, those doors in that window were laying along the road with the sign free on it. Well, I mean, obviously, we're convinced that this is a good idea. And perhaps we can convince other consumers, wouldn't it be great to have old stuff? Because these become a feature in your home, a story to talk about. Everybody wants something that's unique about their own home. But how do we get into the world of builders, you know, where these builders begin to see the value in in salvaging the materials that are part of the buildings that they're tearing down? I think uh, it comes to economics. It's always about how much it costs yeah. and doesn't cost and what's the true cost. But one of the things I know that can happen, um, banks have a lot of control over this, and they can put into their contracts for the loans they make on construction loans and with um, with these big developer people that they have to do certain things that are around reuse and repurpose and sustainability practices um, in order to get a much less uh, interest rate. On- or even government. I mean, government does a lot of construction, mm-hmm. and government's involved in a lot of de- destruction, 
<laughs> both on purpose yeah. and and, uh, and without purpose and in arbitrary ways. Yeah. But um, but if if government is coming in and going to uh, tear down a certain number of buildings as part of a building project, it really should be part of that governmental process to say, okay, let's do an evaluation here. They do environmental impact studies. How about can we salvage materials? What materials can we salvage? Uh, and let's do that to the extent that's practical and possible. Well, given the standards that the government operates under, I think um, I don't think it would be likely. I think it would have to come from places like the banks um, and well, and also um, maybe uh, other kinds of funding because it, it, the government has so many rules and regulations, some of which make no sense at well, all. Well, but this is another rule we could throw in there that makes a certain amount of sense, to us anyway. The guys involved with it, they're going to go, oh, another – Another government rule I got to abide by, but I mean, it would be lovely to see government actually function. Yeah, well, we'll have to have a new one for that. <laughs> okay, political commentary paid for by. <laughs> 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 okay, so well, one I know when we when we do our tours, um, one of the stories because we talked we began this program by saying that when you tear things down, you lose your history, you lose your stories. One of the stories you like to tell is about the tin ceilings uh, at Blue Rock Station. So this is classic, right up there, deconstructing. This is, a, this is the whole story the in a child. nutshell. That's right. So when we first started to build our house that's made out of clean garbage, um, our granddaughter was very small, and she was crazy about the tin ceilings that were in the um, old stores that were in some of the small towns around where our farm was located. And she would walk around and hold my hand and ask me to look at the ceiling with her, and she was in awe of it, and very beautiful, these little squares with designs on them. And then um, when we got ready to finish the interior of the building, uh, we had decided we were going to put that kind of ceiling inside just because she loved it so. And we put a little ad in one of the free throw-out papers that they put in boxes along the country road. And we found a guy who had uh, a tin ceiling for sale. So we uh, we went to look at it, and he told us all about the ceiling and how important it was and uh, that it had been part of a shoe repair shop that had been torn down a number of years before, like 35 or 40 years. And he was so incensed about what was going to happen to the shoe repair shop, he decided that he was going to go in and rip it out one night. And that's exactly what he did. So we bought it, we put it up, uh, we painted it a really nice color. And then one day we had a tour come and an old man came and he looked up at the ceiling and he said, that ceiling looks so familiar. Where did it come from? And we said the old shoe repair shop. And he started to cry because he had been the shoe repairman. And he told all about how wonderful the buildings and the downtown had been before they started tearing everything down. It reminded us of the importance of reuse and repurpose. Okay. Well, and I would like to remind you that you are listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We'd like to thank Adam Rich, our Emmy-winning and now Emmy-nominated producer. And thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully told you back when she was constructing to deconstruct, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and eat your vegetables, Jay Wormke. Okay, Mother until next time. Will sing, and her children will be Find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at blueRockStation.com.